Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to um, the second program of uh, uh, the Public Diplomacy Council of America. Um, it's it's technically our um, first Monday program, but because first Monday was uh, New Year's Day, we decided to move it to uh, January the 8th. Um, but I welcome all of you to, I think, a, a great program that is being um, run by my co-chair, um, my co-chair of the program committee, at the Public Diplomacy Council of America. And um, Nick and I are, are very engaged in, in trying to make the programs as interesting and as, as fun and useful to our audience and to our members as possible. Um, just a little program note here, we, we do look forward to, if you wanna join the program committee, if you're interested in programs, feel free to in, email me or Nick at any time. Um, I think Nick really needs no further introduction. He's a professor at uh, University of Southern California. And I, I think I say this, maybe I'm, uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating. Nick is probably one of the best known public diplomacy scholars, or if not the best known public diplomacy scholar in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that he can uh, share the co, the co-chairman of the, of the program committee of PDCA. Um, he's going to be talking about an upcoming book that I, I'm not sure whether it's available on Amazon or not, but he can tell us. Um, I think it's extremely timely called Reputational Security, Refocusing Public Diplomacy for a Dangerous World. And if there were ever a dangerous world, I think um, it's probably right this moment. So we really look forward to this. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, once Nick has talked, we um, have asked uh, Vivian Walker, who's the uh, head of the Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy, to give a, um, a response. She has worked on this uh, project with Nick, um, and after that, she will moderate the Q&A. If you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick and um, looking forward to a great presentation. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, uh, Joan, um, and um, uh, welcome. Uh, so Joan's uh, correct. Uh, I have evidence that my book is, is um, out hardcover and uh, paper, uh, but it won't be available in the US until middle of February. We are going to make available a, a um, uh, what do you call it, a order form, so you can order it at a discount, but it's only going to be $20. So it's not like, well, sometimes when I've done books, they've come in at a ridiculous price, this one, not so much. Uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about today was really to introduce uh, the concepts of the book and explain why I think it's necessary to have this idea of reputational security and where that idea came from. So first of all, I'll talk about where the idea came from and it's rooted in a mismatch between the uh, vocabulary and approaches we have and the world as I see it right now. I'll then unpack the concept uh, talk about classic cases of reputational security and strategies as introduced by um, uh, states. And then I'll go back into history because that is, after all, I am a historian, so you can't really, <laughs> that's my uh, uh, favorite territory, uh, to speak about historical ideas around this concept of reputation. And then I'll break down uh, the chapters and give you a little insight into uh, where I go in the, the book. And I'll finish up with uh, some final thoughts around the uh, significance of reputation in our world right now. So first of all, uh, the, the mismatch. Well, in 2017, I went to Kazakhstan to uh, visit the um, expo that was taking place. And I had some meetings with people at the foreign ministry. And I realized when I was talking to them about soft power and the general approach to the idea of soft power, that what I was asking about and their policies really didn't uh, fit at all. Um, the uh, Western European countries United States, Canada, and so forth, source soft power 
as some kind of optional extra for a successful country. That if you had everything, well, why not um, uh, maximize your soft power and get a little, a little more? Uh, for Kazakhstan, it was made clear to me that it wasn't just uh, an optional extra. Uh, it was a um, uh, it was uh, acquiring significance in the world, being known in the world, was something that was essential for their survival. And looking at soft power, it occurred to me that in any case, it's only measurable in the, the, the top countries. Uh, there's a soft power 30 index. Uh, the Anhalt Nation Brands Index uh, is limited to around 50 countries. And uh, even the largest indices don't include every country because um, uh, we don't have or people don't have feelings about every single country in the world. So it occurred to me that um, we shouldn't be approaching um, the uh, concepts of international relations with an idea that only fits a limited number of countries in a limited number uh, of times. Uh, the reality that I found uh, talking to people in Kazakhstan and then repeated in uh, other more vulnerable places was that uh, people were seeking to retain what they have. They had a much more defensive approach to uh, how they were understood in the world rather than looking to add something. It was a much more, um, uh, much more defensive. And um, the uh, lesson um, seem to be drawn from the experience of Ukraine in 2014, where when a country was unknown uh, or its narrative was less known uh, in um, the uh, Western world, uh, bad things happened uh, and the skies didn't darken. The world wasn't as appalled as maybe it should have been when Ukraine started losing territory, losing provinces and was uh, victim to uh, what amount uh, to an invasion. So I posited uh, in in uh, after um, you know these visits, I posited the idea of reputational security um, a uh, as a way of thinking about reputation in world affairs. I'm seeking to reframe soft power to shift the debate uh, away from uh, gaining things. Uh, and manipulating towards uh, thinking about um, the negative experiences that countries have around their uh, around their international image and vulnerabilities that they might have. I believe that a reputation is something that can help a country in a time of crisis and that countries that are well known in the world uh, do better in an emergency than countries that nobody cares about or that important, powerful countries in the world uh, don't really uh, understand or aren't interested in. Uh, and I think we can go beyond that and say that a negative reputation actually hurts you in a crisis situation. And so this is uh, this diagram uh, is a, a, a visual representation of, of what I'm talking about. So this column here is a country without reputational security. This is a country with reputational security. And this line is the threshold for external aid. So if you've got a positive reputation, when a disaster happens, you're more likely to be helped than a place that lacks uh, reputation. Uh, a case in point, when I, I was trying to look at how this might have worked in the past, uh, I was struck by the situation in uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia in 1938 and 1939. France and Britain decided to uh, aid Czechoslovakia in, uh, sorry, to aid Poland in April 1939, uh, but had the year before uh, decided not to aid uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, Neville Chamberlain explains at the time of the Munich crisis uh, that it was terrible to contemplate war over a far country and people of whom British people knew nothing. And so uh, I thought that I would measure, um, uh, look at public opinion polls around attitudes to Poland and Czechoslovakia and 
uh, measure salience in newspapers to see in the years running up to 38, 39, I posited that there would be more references to Poland. Poland would be better known than uh, Czechoslovakia. And that proved absolutely to be the case. And uh, it was shown up in public opinion too. People were much more aware of uh, Poland than they were of Czechoslovakia. So this gave me, um, uh, I would put together this um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, variation on my basic uh, diagram. The reason that the threshold is uh, slanted is that I think by 1939, people were more frightened of Hitler, so there was a lower threshold uh, to be uh, aided. But Poland already had uh, um, a, a better, uh, was better established in people's imaginations in France and the UK. Uh, than Czechoslovakia was. Uh, both countries um, uh, dated in, the, in at that moment from uh, the uh, peace at the end of uh, the Second World, uh, the First World War. But Czechoslovakia was a new name. Poland was an old name reviving an old uh, kingdom uh, familiar to uh, audiences in Europe. Flashing forward, my second case was to look at NATO aid to uh, Ukraine uh, at the beginning of the um, uh, Ukraine crisis, and then to compare that to um, uh, the situation at the beginning of, of all out war. My argument is that by telling its story to the world, Ukraine had in the run up to the invasion in uh, February, 2022, had achieved reputational security. Uh, they had told their story, they'd begun cultural work, they'd um, uh, uh, had all kinds of uh, outreach to make sure that people in uh, Western Europe, in, in the NATO countries especially, knew what Ukraine was and that it was uh, a, a, it had all kinds of um, unique elements in its identity, it had a, had a story distinct from being just a former uh, province of uh, the Soviet Union. Um, the problem is, uh, as we saw since the outbreak of the um, full-scale war uh, for Ukraine, uh, that uh, Russia also has a degree of reputational security. Uh, its reputation uh, from the Cold War, from its um, uh, role in fighting against colonialism in the 1960s, 70s, uh, has um, stayed with it, um, and this is part of uh, why the Global South still supports uh, Russia in the war. So this is my diagram of uh, reputational security uh, as it affects um, Russia's war in, in, in Ukraine. With Ukraine lacking reputational security in 2014, having acquired it uh, in the intervening period, and uh, and then by 2023, uh, once war had begun, there was this tremendous surge of uh, sympathy for Ukraine, which took it even higher, way above the threshold for aid. So that's the basic uh, territory I'm in. My argument is that if uh, um, reputation, uh, if it's absent, well, it needs to be developed. This explains why smaller countries are looking for uh, recognition. Kosovo's put tremendous emphasis on being recognized by uh, as many places as uh, as possible. Uh, it sees its Olympic medals, the first Olympic medal won by someone from Kosovo, uh, which, ha which happened only in uh, 2016. This was a tremendous uh, deal. We also can look at Ukraine's reputation diplomacy. Uh, in 2021, when the foreign ministry of Ukraine had a lot to worry about, they also took time to uh, send high profile complaints to Netflix about the reputation, about the representation of a Ukrainian character in the TV show Emily in Paris. Uh, the foreign minister of Ukraine said at that point, the reputation of Ukraine is a matter of national security. So he's seeing it as being integral to uh, Ukraine's um, 
uh, survival. And Dimitro Kuleba, in fact, had been uh, head of the uh, of Ukrainian cultural diplomacy. So it's an, one of the few examples we have right now of a public diplomacy expert transitioning into the number one role uh, of uh, in um, foreign relations. And I think Ukraine has done pretty well uh, making that particular skill set choice. Uh, if you have a reputation, uh, then it's something that needs to be defended. Here again, we see cases. Um, Johnson's uh, thinking around the Vietnam War is heavily influenced by his desire to preserve America's reputation. That was part of the, one of the assets, one of the, uh, the vital interests of the United States in Vietnam. So he would speak about fighting for America's credibility. Similarly, in the Falklands War, um, Margaret Thatcher was fighting to maintain the um, uh, perce uh, perceptions of uh, the UK, that it couldn't be pushed around. She wasn't so worried about losing the Falkland Islands, but the uh, implication that the UK could be bullied in other places in the world was something that she really wanted to avoid. Hence, uh, some people called uh, the Falklands Malvinas War the War of Thatcher's Face. We can see from the way in which image uh, politics works right now that uh, enemies are very aware of the power of reputation. And so uh, reputations are embattled. There are multiple attacks on countries' reputations. Uh, think of the way in which Russian media, Kremlin media, has targeted the Nordic countries, uh, claiming in multiple stories that uh, Scandinavia is in decline. Uh, even this particular uh, story um, was linking um, uh, uh, Nordic adoption of um, uh, Russian kids to um, uh, population decline and to uh, Nordic perversion, the idea that uh, they only wanted Russian kids to do bad things to them. During the Qatar crisis between 2017 and 2021, there was all kinds of uh, negative reputational campaigning going on. Uh, UAE even uh, financed a pretty dreadful heist movie designed to uh, defame uh, Qatar. Um, it lost a lot of money. During COVID-19, think back to the pandemic and the way in which um, uh, uh, leadership in both China and in the United States each sought to blame the other as the point of origin of the uh, virus. This is an old story. Uh, if you look at Daniel Defoe's account of the Great Plague of 1665, uh, he uh, documents uh, the Dutch um, blaming uh, Britain uh, for the plague and then seeking to move in on British trading uh, operations in the Mediterranean on the back of that. So nothing new under the sun. Um, uh, when I was doing my uh, historical work on public diplomacy, I spent a long time talking to Barry Zorthian, who had directed um, USIA's um, and, in fact, the, the US uh, public affairs operation in, in Vietnam. And he told me that he had this way of explaining what public diplomacy should be like, and it really fits with this idea of reputational security. He well, when asked how he saw the war, he said, well, he believed the United States should apply the Mercer Doctrine. And people were used to hearing about Rostow and various other gurus of international affairs and counterinsurgency. And so they'd ask uh, Barry Zorthian, so Mercer, who's, who's Mercer? Where does he teach? And he'd say, oh, I mean, Johnny Mercer. Uh, he said uh, that he thought that in its um, uh, approach to uh, the war, the United States should accentuate the positive. That means talk about, you know, the, the uh, beneficial things that were happening, its successes, but also eliminate the negative, not just removing negative stories, but actually removing negative behaviors. So uh, referring to John, Johnny Mercer's famous song, accentuate the positive, uh, I eliminate the negative, uh, latch on to the affirmative and don't mess with Mr. in between. Now, it's easy to find the first part in public diplomacy strategy, 
we've had uh, years and years of countries seeking to accentuate the positives in what they do. It is harder to find the second part, harder to find countries that are seeking to uh, eliminate the negative, that is actually change reality to make it less uh, negative in the eyes of foreign audiences. It's hard to find, but not impossible to find. Uh, for example, there are three examples that spring to mind in the United States. Uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy understood that in order to combat the Soviet Union's relentless propaganda about American racism, uh, they couldn't just say that things were great in the United States. They also had to work to eliminate uh, racism uh, as, as much as they could to push back against the institutionalized racism in the United States. And this is the thesis uh, that Mary Dudziak um, uh, put in, um, in uh, 2000 in her book, Cold War Civil Rights. Similarly, Lyndon Johnson knew that uh, 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 or learned that American immigration policy was uh, a, a drag on the country's reputation. The country was accused of being racist, especially towards uh, Asian countries because of immigration laws. So in 1965, he changed the reality. He made a speech and initiated reforms to make America's immigration policy less racist. Similarly, in the 70s, Jimmy Carter pushing back on uh, on, on human rights, or aligning uh, the strategy of the United States with human rights was doing the same thing, changing the realities of policy to align with uh, a, a better uh, image for the United States. Can we go deeper? Yes, I think we can. And at this point, I'd like to just take a little while to talk about how, um, uh, how reputation has developed historically. What Thucydides uh, had psychological factors at the heart of his famous formulation of where war comes from. Fear, honor, and interest. Honor, I think, is a, a, a synonym for uh, reputation. Similarly, when we look at English medieval history, you have these very uh, uh, curious uh, episodes uh, like um, when Richard the Lionheart had a quarrel with the Duke of Austria, uh, the Duke had placed his banner on the battlements of Acre, uh, equal with the banners of the King of France and the King of England, and he was just a Duke. Richard seized the banner and threw it into the moat, uh, disrupting the diplomacy of the Third Crusade. He did this in order to protect the image, his image, as a monarch. Uh, people thought, uh, or historians have, have dismissed this as being some kind of eccentric behavior, but uh, we can reframe it and think that it actually goes to the heart of understanding a, the importance of reputation. Machiavelli spoke about how princes should conduct themselves in order to maximize their reputation, conducting great enterprises. Shakespeare speaks about the importance of reputation. His quote from Measure to Measure, oh, it is excellent to have a giant strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant, I think is a really good way into one of the great ironies of uh, power. Uh, Louis XIV um, was very concerned about his reputation and applied diplomatic pressure on countries like the Netherlands, which had a lot of uh, newspapers to censor them so that they were not um, uh, printing uh, uh, anti-Louis uh, propaganda, like uh, this particular picture upset him, showing the Sun King falling out of his, his chariot. Again, a concern for reputation. Thomas Jefferson, um, as ambassador to France and then as president, understood the importance of the United States having a, a, um, a, a great reputation in the world and actually echoes Shakespeare's point, the less we use our power, the greater it will be, seeing power uh, as coming in part from reputation. Von Bülow, as German chancellor, uh, brought his country into a policy of imperialism uh, in order to maximize its reputation. 
Woodrow Wilson spoke about the United States staying initially out of World War I to maximize its reputation. And today, uh, as I've already argued, we see reputation as being a target in uh, world affairs, as being something of an obsession uh, of countries um, uh, seeking to uh, maximize their advantage. How do I tackle this in uh, the book? Well, I begin by showing the limits of soft power as understood by countries today and using it to set up uh, this frame for thinking about uh, how we uh, talk about world affairs uh, and uh, an agenda for uh, how a country can conduct itself. The agenda that includes both uh, public diplomacy to maximize the uh, uh, positive uh, uh, aspects of an international image and reform at home to take the negatives off the table. I then uh, use a, um, a historical uh, frame to um, discuss uh, one of the problems that we have right now that I think makes all these issues of reputation more uh, serious, and that is the whole problem of technology. Uh, I think that new, or I argue that new technologies bring tremendous disruption to um, uh, the uh, body politic. And in fact, that every major crisis in the 20th century, or the most serious crises in the 20th century, coincided with the coming of a new technology. Uh, I think that um, if you have a, the new, new communication technology, if you give people long enough, they will adjust to a news platform and will be less disrupted by it, less driven hither and thither by it. But when a platform is new, people are much more malleable. And so uh, I, I make arguments that uh, the First World War, Second World War and Cold War were um, not only made worse by advent of new media technologies, uh, which would be popular press in the First World War, uh, radio and newsreel in the origins of the Second, and uh, TV in the uh, run-up to the Cold War and early days of the Cold War. But I think we need to think about these as being uh, um, the disruption that came from these new technologies as being one of the forces that could not be contained, that allowed the crises to boil over into much more uh, serious um, disruptive uh, incidents than they need have been. So I would say that uh, the new media technology should serve as an alarm bell and should be warning us uh, to be on our guard against tremendous international relations disruption. Uh, I then want to look at, or I then look at um, the history of counter propaganda and uh, the ways in which um, uh, attacks on reputation have been dealt with um, historically. Among the cases I look at in some detail is one that I know is familiar to this audience, and that is the Soviet Union's uh, defamatory um, claims that the United States had invented the AIDS virus and uh, was using it as a bioweapon. So I look at these old successes. I go back to uh, World War I and other, World War II and other cases of countering disinformation. And I find that there is one uh, lesson uh, where a lot of the uh, success begins, and that's by listening, by paying attention to what's going on and what the enemy is uh, claiming. Uh, I then, uh, in my fourth chapter, look at media development, which I think is one of the solutions uh, around uh, securing a reputation, because our reputations are worse uh, in uh, uh, places where media is most disrupted and populations are most stirred up. So uh, I see a, a, a power in promoting uh, literacy and a power in promoting transparency of media. And I have a, a long case study in this chapter of the way in which American investment in media, in our media, particularly the uh, ability of um, Armenian, uh, 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 American-funded uh, Armenian uh, TV um, and uh, um, internet 
uh, news stations, including uh, Radio uh, Free Europe, uh, live streamed uh, the street protests against the uh, government back during the uh, revolution a couple of years ago and made it impossible for the old government to uh, to clamp down. So uh, that uh, success through transparency, I think, is a very good, uh, very good case. Uh, and then as another strategy uh, is um, to deal with disruption in the information environment is uh, information disarmament. And this is one that has been largely uh, forgotten about. It's one of the forgotten successes of the 1980s is the fact that at a certain point, Reagan and Gorbachev resolved to address the problem of mutual demonization and looked for diplomatic solutions to the propaganda uh, battle. Uh, this is a fascinating story. It includes within it uh, the story of the space bridges, the um, uh, satellite TV shows that united uh, Soviet and American audiences and allowed uh, discussion of, of stereotypes uh, and contact between uh, ordinary people. It includes um, uh, uh, mutual agreements, even the establishment of a hotline between uh, Washington and Moscow to respond to uh, disinformation allegations so that uh, incorrect news could be corrected swiftly and in real time. I then move on to diaspora diplomacy, and I look at the way in which uh, diasporas have become central to uh, reputation. My cases here include uh, some of the um, uh, approaches that we saw at the Expo in uh, Dubai in 2020. Uh, an awareness of diasporas has created uh, new content. Uh, uh, the Philippines reached out to the people of, um, of, of Dubai uh, with their pavilion uh, presenting their uh, diaspora as a gift to the world. Uh, also, we can see diasporas being used to create new uh, connections between countries. Uh, then, uh, as I bring things to a conclusion, I talk about cultural diplomacy as being one of the major ways in which countries are able to establish their relevance to the world, to enhance their reputation and show that they uh, deserve uh, a um, uh, attention on the world stage. And the metaphor I use is to go to uh, that bit of training, the security training that diplomats receive, where they are told if they're ever uh, taken hostage, they should do whatever they can to bring themselves alive to their captor, to um, show that they're a person with a family, with interests, and uh, try to establish a uh, Oh, what's the word, a shared um, rapport. Uh, and I see cultural diplomacy as being a method for establishing rapport with the world, for uh, showing that you are worthy of global uh, empathy and um, uh, opening up, dramatizing your identity to a world audience. Uh, we can also use culture as a zone in which we can practice partnership. Uh, a kind of a low risk area to establish the habits of working together uh, that we need to solve the shared problems we all face. Uh, I then talk about the implications of all this for the United States. And you won't be surprised that I think we need a better structure for public diplomacy, something that not only gets America's story told more effectively in the world, but also gives diplomats who can see what the world thinks about the United States and where the world worries about the United States and feed that into a better policy and a better reality at home. The other point that I make uh, is that uh, reputation is now a, a collective issue. The problem isn't just that the adversaries of the United States are dis detracting from the image of America. The problem is that they are detracting from the image of the West, from the image of democracy, and from the values of um, 
uh, of, of democracy that are at the heart of our, uh, our culture. And so we need to work together with partners in what I call a collective reputational security. And uh, this idea that we're all in it together, I think has, has been under uh, attended to uh, thus far. Uh, finally, my conclusion looks specifically at the case of the war in Ukraine and draws lessons from Ukraine for our uh, own time. Concluding then, the challenge we face today is not just getting a better image, it's also addressing the question of how should we actually be better and deserve that better image. We need to be honest about our uh, bits. I think we can learn by researching other eras and seeing how these uh, issues played out in the past. What I want to do next, my next issue, is to think about how the stories we tell, uh, our narratives intersect with reputations and what um, uh, sp special power comes from the um, uh, energy we see in a narrative it, and especially the way in which a narrative might be seen as predicting the future, projecting the story of the country into uh, the future. So how do our images affect what people expect to happen? But as with all my work, I come back to one thing that we have to begin by listening. Thanks for your attention. Um, the book uh, soon to be available, and you're welcome to email me directly, carl at usc.edu. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I think I left uh, Vivian with a task and a half to try and uh, uh, draw something coherent out of that. But um, thank you, Vivian, for agreeing to give it a to take a step. <laughs> Oh, it's it's an honor and a pleasure. I will try to be quick, uh, however, because I do want to give the opportunity for our audience to ask some questions. Uh, um, I will start out by saying that I am, uh, uh, as Nick already knows, uh, a, a real a real fan of this book. I see it as a kind of a paradigm shift in the way that we think about public diplomacy, especially public diplomacy in the digital age. Um, and it really builds a compelling case for a country's reputation as an essential uh, source of legitimacy and security. So what I'd like to do really uh, quickly is run through six key insights, or at least insights that I took from this book and that I will carry forward in my own work, and then uh, a quick practical application of how uh, I plan to put this to work with Nick's help uh, at a conference in Georgia later this spring. So I think uh, number one on the six key insights is the centrality of the role of reputation, national reputation to a country's security and legitimacy. We've talked for years, decades about the value of you know, projecting soft power legitimacy, but we thought of it in terms of the soft power aspect of it. But I think what Nick does very effectively is give it a kind of a, for want of a better word, a hard power connotation, how national rep, national reputation really feeds into uh, hard power concerns such as security uh, and legitimacy. So that's number one. The number two insight for me is something that Nick did not refer to directly in his presentation, but a reminder of the fundamental role of cognitive bias in, how, in shaping human perceptions and behaviors. And so, so much of this effort to think about reputation is to then be thinking about what are the prevailing beliefs, biases, attitudes that audiences have that uh, fundamentally shape how they perceive reputation. So I think that's really well done. Um, Nick already spoke about um, the fact that paradigm shifts in communication tools have always been disruptive. And I think that's a very good point uh, to, to dwell on because while we are uh, periodically, as Nick has pointed out, confronted with new technologies that seem overwhelming and threatening, we have also found ways to use those tools uh, to, uh, to further our interests in the information space. So disruptive, but also in some very interesting ways, productive and creative. 
Um, his discussion of the emergence of, the, of toxic media disruption is also, uh, I think, really interesting. We are indeed in a new era of political and politicized communication. Um, and, uh, and that certainly has an impact on the degree to which a country is able to preserve its reputational security. I also um, uh, took away uh, his insights with respect to what he calls at different points, information disarmament. I like that way of thinking about it. And the sense that we need to step back from mutual demonization, uh, I would go call that the new mad, in fact, new mutually assured destruction, because I really think there is a, a serious danger to demonize uh, the enemy uh, at the expense of our own ability to project legitimacy. And um, he talks a little bit, I think, in the book about sort of rethinking or refocusing that strategy of containment. Um, you know, think of US information agency really as uh, an extension of Kennan's famous strategy of containment, uh, contain Soviet influence, Soviet ideology, not by denigrating it in the global information so much, space so much as providing coherent alternatives. So contain through alternatives. Um, and I think that comes out very well. And finally, the sixth uh, uh, insight is um, the acknowledgement of culture, not only as a foundational component of a, of a positive reputation, but as a powerful instrument of national security. We don't always make that connection between culture and security. And I think the case of Ukraine, which he cited, uh, is, is a great example in which um, uh, since the beginning in 2014 with that sort of shock of, con of, of confrontation in the global information space, um, you, Ukraine has done a really extraordinary job in translating its cultural assets into a source of national security. Um, I think the challenge Ukraine has, and, and that we can perhaps, and other countries in a similar situation, is how to work that cultural reputation component without sliding into the coercive use of culture, which raises all sorts of other questions. All right, that's it for the six insights. And then really quickly, the, the practice. So um, I told you that this uh, that his book, his concept was parad paradigm paradigmatic for me. And it really influenced um, uh, my approach to this conference on security and democracy amid geopolitical rivalry that's being hosted in Tbilisi, Georgia later, uh, later this spring. This is a conference uh, whose who's organizers, a prominent think tank in Georgia, once they put Georgia back on an international agenda to examine the security, democracy, nexus, and the global geopolitical rivalry in the Georgian context. And they wanted me to talk or put together a panel on another panel on disinformation and how to counter authoritarian influence. And I think the problem with this constant focus on disinformation is it, it you know, disinformation is about ceding control to the narrative of the opponent. It's largely defensive. I wanted to get Georgia and other states to think more um, uh, offensively, offensively by shifting the focus instead to reputational security. How do you take control over the narrative about your country in the global uh, information space? What would uh, information disarmament uh, uh, look like for a country like Georgia? How can support for independent media, free speech, media literacy, all the tools of countering disinformation be refreshed? And so uh, we've reframed this component and happily Nick is going to be speaking uh, for me uh, at this conference to uh, as, uh, establish a set of framing questions. What are the prevailing per perceptions of Georgia and how do these perceptions impact its, its national reputation? How can Georgia what can it do to build or reclaim credibility? How can it be better to, to use um, uh, Nick's term? And what can Georgia, how can Georgia address its vulnerability to attempts to undermine its national reputation and alliances? All this to say, and, and to be continued, we'll, we'll see what comes out of this, but all this to say that um, this sort of shift in, in thinking about uh, reputation, I think has some powerful applications as we go forward, and particularly as we work with smaller countries, vulnerable countries like Georgia and others uh, as they confront these own challenges for themselves. So with that, and with the 15 minutes, no, not even 10 minutes left <laughs> we have for Q&A, um, let me turn quickly to the questions and, and um, 
see what we have here. Uh, Gordon sent me a question before um, okay. uh, we, we began. Uh, and asked me if I was president, what would I do to promote America's reputational security? And the uh, first thing I'd do is I'd use the system that we already have. Uh, and I would not wait uh, two and a half years to nominate a uh, an R, a uh, uh, Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy. Uh, I think we need somebody who cares in the White House with the president, uh, as Eisenhower did. Eisenhower yeah, yeah. had uh, C.D. Jackson coordinating uh, America's psychological approach to the world. And I think we need somebody like that right now, right next to and with equivalent status to a national security advisor. We need to spend money on this. It's not going to happen uh, cheaply. Uh, and it's more than just the United States. We need to work with allies and ultimately building on what Vivian said about uh, information disarmament. At some point, we're going to need to work with adversaries, too. I think Russia is a lost cause, but China is not. And we need to think about how do we talk about each other? And to me, I'm worried by the asymmetry in knowledge where China knows everything about us and our culture, and we still know very, very little about theirs. Not just ordinary people, but uh, a lot of uh, international relations professionals of various kinds still don't know much about um, uh, China, and we're going to have to uh, address that. So that's in a nutshell what I do, but I'm not running. <laughs> oh, any, okay. Not this around. time. Not at this time. All right. Let's um, turn to uh, the first question here from Greta Morris. Greta asks, how do you see the idea of reputa reputational security in the context of the war in Gaza? Well, I think that that's an excellent question. That You can see how the Gaza campaign is being fought out as a, 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 with a, on a reputational uh, front with the, the contending parties, each trying to enhance their own reputation uh, and um, uh, uh, undermine the reputation of their, their adversary. But the other thing that struck me about the Gaza war is the extent to which um, our feelings or the mass feelings of the world flow from archetypes and gut reactions. Uh, I think that there is a, a bias in any war towards the victim and towards the side we see as being small. And both sides in the Gaza war have positioned themselves as being the victims, as being uh, 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 sm small. And though Israel is able to uh, uh, mobilize overwhelming force, it points, point, points out that it's small in its neighborhood and that uh, Hamas uh, teamed with Iran is a formidable adversary. So if you like, it's a, a conflict over who is David and who is Goliath in this uh, conflict. The other bias that I think you see uh, coming out in the in the Gaza war is the bias towards the similar, where states that feel similar to uh, one side uh, have sympathy for that side. And there's been a lot of arguments from both sides saying, see how we are similar to you, uh, and this terrible thing is happening uh, to to us. So th that's what I'm taking from it, is the importance of reputation and the importance of archetypes informing reputation, uh, because these attitudes have not come from uh, people studying the uh, situation for year and year after year after year, and then coming to a decision. There's a lot of gut reaction and and uh, powerful feelings coming from gut reaction uh, around the world uh, in this um, in this crisis. Great, thank you so much. All right, next question from Bruce Gregory: praises innovative thinking, effective examples, consequential conclusions. The question. Joe Nye writes about political entities gaining and losing soft power and correlations between hard power and soft power. Could you drill down on one or two key conceptual differences between reputational security and soft power? Well, I think that all the elements of reputational security are present in Nye. My problem is not with what Professor Nye has written, it's with what the rest of the world has read in his work. And um, how can we have something that means the same thing to uh, Russia and China and India and the United States and takes them in completely different uh, 
uh, directions. So that's my problem. It's not with the theory of soft power, but with the practice, and particularly the way in which the practice has neglected this problem of who are you uh, really? And soft power is understood as being all about uh, getting people to watch your movies, not about um, uh, cleaning up uh, corruption uh, in your government. <laughs> Uh, and that's so to me, that's the that's the problem. Uh, I, I looked at um, the soft power discourse and found there's only one case where people uh, see soft power as being linked to the country's actual behavior. And that's Japan, where for some weird reason, Westerners are very ready to say, now, if Japan wants a, 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 the best international image, they should stop uh, letting prime ministers go to the Yakasuni shrine, stop eating dolphins stop eating whales. So um, we're all ready to tell Japan to behave better, but without making that part of uh, the um, uh, soft power discourse around the United States. Great. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So for our next question, we are turning to Josh Manley, who asks, are there any countries with medium to high reputational security that you believe might not receive international backing in a potential crisis? Interesting question. Well, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's an, that, that it, it depends on the, the um, it depends on the crisis. Um, and I'd have to think uh, carefully uh, about that. When a crisis happens, you can see how reputation uh, affects the outcome. And, and a, a case in point was last year when that dreadful earthquake hit the um, Eastern Mediterranean, that that was understood as being the Turkish earthquake, um, but it, and, and Turkey was a uh, target for aid, but it also happened in Syria. Uh, but Syria has such a terrible reputation that um, it didn't receive the aid. And I think people's affections for Turkey uh, and, and, and concern for Turkey showed through. So you could see how to, uh, to, uh, Turkey has a different kind of uh, reputation as uh, uh, to, to, to that of, uh, of, of Syria. Uh, I think there are places that I'd be worried about, but I'd rather not talk about it in this, uh, in this forum, if that's okay. But it's a very good question. Great. All right, I think we have time for one more question with a fairly quick answer, Nick. Um, this is from uh, Lucia Romero. For countries with high rates of corruption and violence, do you have any case of success on which they could shift that narrative into a good reputation? And uh, Ms. Romero is based in Mexico. Yeah, well, that's a, um, that's a, a, a good case. Uh, I I think that um, what what's important is to uh, be honest about problems. And my sense of international audiences is that they respect honesty and can detect uh, distraction and are familiar with. Um, uh, I'm trying to find <laughs> a PG term for uh, 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 they, they can they can sniff out a lie, uh, and um, so. Um, uh, but uh, yes, there's a need to deal with there's a need to deal with um, realities, and I do see countries that are concerned with their negative reputations and are looking for cultural outreach as a way of saying they're more than just violence. Right now, Colombia uh, is doing some really interesting sport diplomacy. And in fact, uh, later in the, in the season, we will have a, a member of the Colombian foreign ministry talking about Colombian sport diplomacy. And that seems to me a, 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 to be a behavior that is very much in this ballpark of reputation management and understanding that reputation has security consequences. It's not just an optional extra. That's absolutely true. And what you said at the beginning of your response about the importance of, of a certain amount of honesty and humility uh, as, as a precursor to any kind of credibility in this, in this space uh, also rings true. And with that, um, I would uh, like to turn to uh, distinguished PDCA council member Anne Barbaro, uh, who is also a longtime board member of the Lois Roth Foundation, 
to make some concluding remarks. Uh, before we do that, thank you, Nick. It was, as always, a pleasure to have this opportunity to work with you and to comment on your truly fine work. So Thanks, with that, William. Anne, uh, over to you. Thank you, Vivian, and thanks to Nick for mentioning cultural diplomacy as part of reputational security. That leads very nicely into the February 5th PDCA webinar. Uh, before I mention that specific program, I'd like to thank our co-hosts, the USC Annenberg Center for Communication Leadership and Policy, and the George Washington University Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. I'd especially like to thank Gabby Stahl, the PDCA Tom Tuck Fellow, and our tech host today. The Monday, February 5th PDCA webinar, First Monday Forum, will be a program co-sponsored with the Lois Roth Foundation, and it will be called The Best of Cultural Diplomacy Today, Winners of the Lois Roth Foundation Awards for Excellence in Cultural Diplomacy. It will feature three winners of those awards. One will be a foreign service officer, one will be a locally employed staff member, and the third will be a member of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the Department of State. Those are the three pillars uh, that support cultural programming in the field at embassies overseas. These people are gonna describe some of the amazing programs that they do to bring together our country with countries overseas and to deliver the messages that we would like them to hear and also to hear what their concerns are in regard to the policies and programs that we care about. So please join us to register for this event, go to publicdiplomacycouncil.org and to learn more about the Lois Roth Foundation, please visit loisrothfoundation.org. We hope to see you on February 5th. Thank you.